In 1996, Weekly Shonen Jump magazine published the first issue of Kazuki Takahashi's Yu-Gi-Oh! A series where a young boy named Yugi comes into the possession of a mystical artifact called the Millennium Puzzle, which itself is possessed by the spirit of an ancient pharaoh who at first called himself Yami, but was later revealed to be named Atem. Yugi and Atem would go on numerous adventures together over the next eight years, with the series they debuted in becoming a runaway hit selling 40 million copies by the series' end in 2004, and subsequently spawning five seasons of television in the United States and Japan, plus a beloved card game series, with Greater himself gaining a net worth of about $20 million USD after years and years of toiling away at works neither he nor his industry thought much of. Sadly though, Kazuki Takahashi would pass away on July 4th, 2022 at the age of 60 years old, having drowned while scuba diving. My mother was always very wary of what I was allowed to watch on television as a child. As such, I was never allowed to watch Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was growing up, nor really ever play the card game. But because I was a little stinker as a kid, I still snuck the poor kids dub on Kids WB and Cartoon Network whenever I could, because, well, I liked it. I thought it was really fun watching all these larger-than-life conflicts play out over a card game where you make digital projections of monsters, wizards, and medieval knights fight each other. I thought Yugi and Yami were a cool duo, the young hero who anchored the team and made sure they were leading from the heart and not because they just wanted to win for the sake of winning, and his m more mature and courageous counterpart who never doubted himself for a moment and always knew just how to win the battle so that their friends could be safe and sound. It was a great dynamic and I enjoyed it so much. Hell, Yu-Gi-Oh! was kind of part of my channel. I have a video series where I compare pieces of media and I call that series Let's Duel, where after a preamble I say, with all that said, take it away Pharaoh, and then I insert a clip from Yu-Gi-Oh!'s title sequence where Yami says it's time to do 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 duel. I've always had a warm and soft feeling watching this show. I remember when I was a kid, my younger sister and I had to live with my aunt and uncle for a couple months because my dad was in the hospital after a bad car accident and my mom would stay with him to make sure he was okay. My aunt and uncle went ahead and let me and my sister watch most of the shows that my mom wouldn't let us watch. And while it was in general just a lot of fun to watch those shows, it was also just good to be able to spend more time worrying about silly things like if Yami and Yugi could prevent Merrick from plunging the world into the Shadow Realm, instead of more pressing things like, is my dad going to be okay? And on top of all of that, I've just been really wanting to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! At the end of my review for 2016's Doctor Strange and 2021's WandaVision, I mentioned that I planned on doing a video about the MCU's Phase 1, and then doing a video about something else that I hadn't talked about before. Check all of those out, and then come back for my video discussing the MCU's Phase 1, and then I'm going to be mixing up things some by talking about something else entirely that I'll wait until the next video to tell you all about. Well, at this point, I'd say the moment has pretty well passed on that MCU video, so I'll be pushing that back to sometime, hopefully in May next year, which leads to the something else which, while it was always going to be Yu-Gi-Oh!, it feels all the more appropriate now given what's happened. So before I say anything else, let me just send my love and my best wishes to Kasuki's wife, Rumiko, and their children. I can't imagine what it's like to lose a parent. I hope I never have to know what it's like to lose my spouse. So in that spirit, this video won't be quite as jokey as some of my other videos. And while little Karibo is fucking hilarious, I'll be making a point not to reference him in his Yu-Gi-Oh! Bridged series too often, because I don't want to spend too much time making fun of this series. Not because I think you can't make fun of this series. This series is rife with material you can make fun of, lovingly or not. But I want to make a video that's less of a pure critical analysis and more of a mix of that and just a straight up tribute to this really wonderful piece of my childhood that Kazuki made possible. So with all that said, Takahashi-san, arigato, go zom, mai ashita, anshin shaita, shaito yasumo, yasumi, kudaisai. I obviously can't speak Japanese, but I hope it's the thought that counts. Anyway, with all that said, take it away, Mr. Cumberbatch. <sighs> Shall we be- You know what, actually, actually, Benedict, on second thought, let's hear it from the Pharaoh this time. It's time to do 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 do
The first episode of this series is every bit as goofy as you remember. It gives you the basic flavor of what this series will be going forward, but you can tell if ever there was a pilot, this is it. Also, it really is just that silly to see Kaiba go to so much damn trouble to steal Mr. Mudo's Blue Eyes White Dragon so it can't be used against him when he literally has three already. Even if someone can destroy your Blue Eyes with theirs, they'll lose theirs in a stalemate. 3,000 attack points versus 3,000 attack points means both monsters are destroyed. You'd both be down one, which would leave you guys at 2-0. No, I just said I didn't want to use too many Yu-Gi-Oh! abridged clips, but I really think this warrants it. That Kaiba kid needs to get laid. Big time. That said, while it is corny as all hell, it really is sweet to see Taya, Joey, and Tristan all backing up Yugi so hard in this first episode. They're all in his corner and they're all ready to support Yugi whether they're with him or not. And I really like how you get a taste for the idea that Yugi and Yami are two separate people. Through the whole duel, you hear Yugi's thoughts but you see Yami dueling. So you assume they're basically the same guy, but when Yugi starts to doubt himself, it's Yami who pulls his head back into the game. It's a nice touch. Overall, while I don't think this is an especially strong start to the series, it does give you a solid foundation for what comes next. 6 out of 10. For the purpose of this first arc, I'll be breaking up this story into the main character arcs. I won't be doing this with the rest of the show because it's far more plot-centric than character-based when compared to this arc. Also, to be clear, my analysis will be based on the four kids dub of the Yu-Gi-Oh! series, as it is what I'm most familiar with, and what I feel the most comfortable analyzing. If you're someone who would prefer to hear a discussion of the original Japanese series, well, you won't be finding it here, but I'm sure on the great wide internet, you'll find something suited to your needs somewhere. So with that all out of the way, let's get into what the scope of this portion of my discussion will be. I'll be going over the individual arcs of who I would call the four main characters of Duelist Kingdom. Those being Yugi, Joey, Kaiba, and Mai. I'll start with Yugi, who is of course our main character. Then we'll move on to Kaiba and Mai, who I don't think have as much development. And then we'll end on Joey, who has the most development. And then we'll go on to discuss the arc of the main antagonist of Duelist Kingdom, that being the one and only Maximilian Pegasus. And then we'll talk about the actual story arc. So. Let's go. Yugi's arc doesn't begin properly until the end of his second duel with Kaiba. Yugi has Kaiba dead to rights, but Kaiba isn't willing to accept defeat and literally threatens to end himself if Yugi goes through with his final attack. Yugi wants to concede the duel, but Yami knows that beating Kaiba means entry into Pegasus Castle, which means they can only save Grandpa if they beat Kaiba. So he decides to not give in to the manipulations and declares an attack. Yugi doesn't want Kaiba to hurt himself, so he bites off Yami's control and calls off his attack, leaving him wide open for Kaiba to counter and win the duel. Yugi is then utterly terrified to let the spirit take control of his body again, to the point that he almost swears off dueling completely before being talked out of that line of thinking by Mai. Yugi then decides he'll duel again, but he's not letting Yami call his shots anymore when they duel. Then, the time comes to actually duel Mai in the semifinals of the tournament, and he's getting his butt kicked all while Yami is literally begging Yugi to let him help him. Yugi eventually accepts the spirit's help when he promises to think more about the means that they use to reach their end goal, instead of just thinking that the ends justifies those means. Together with Yami, his courage pushing Yugi to find the will to win, and Yugi's compassion tempering Yami's competitive spirit, they find a way to beat Mai, who opts to surrender rather than prolong the inevitable. This is about the end of their arc until they finally get to lock horns with Pegasus. Having dueled the man once before and witnessing the way the old man effortlessly destroyed their rival Kaiba, Yugi realizes that Pegasus will always have an advantage over them because he can see their thoughts and therefore always know what card they're going to play. But therein lies the solution. He'll always have an advantage over them. He'll always be able to one-up Yami Yugi. But what if he wasn't facing Yami Yugi. What if he was facing Yami and Yugi? They're two minds sharing one body, so they'll take advantage of that. 
Yugi will, will take the driver's seat for a turn and won't allow Yami to see whatever it is he has planned. And then after that, Yami will step back in, but won't let Yugi see what he's up to. It's a perfect strategy, and it's the ultimate encapsulation of Yugi's arc. He's gone from not thinking anything of the spirit of his Millennium Puzzle, to being terrified of him, to trusting him so much, he'll let him control his body without him knowing a thing about what he's doing. It's a quite lovely story, honestly. Mai's arc is pretty simple. She goes from someone who believes in manipulating people and cheating to win and can't be graceful in defeat to someone who plays a good clean duel and can lose with dignity. She goes from someone who only cares about number one and whose only priority is getting rich and living large to someone who, while still wanting to get money to earn a life of luxury, also cares about people and wants to do right by everyone. That's nice. I like it. Does Kaiba even have an arc? Half of everything we learn about Kaiba is from his brother Mokuba, who's constantly going on about what a wonderful man he is and how much he's always made him a priority. And everything we see of Kaiba shows us that that is still true, but in, in terms of the way he talks about everyone else, well, he does regard Yugi with more respect than he did before their first duel. He still talks down to his opponents constantly and doesn't show anyone much respect for stepping up to the plate against him. This is best exemplified by his duel with Joey, where he not only stomps him into the dirt, but also goes out of his way to, com to humiliate him by calling him a dog and saying he was just a casualty of his war with Pegasus. There's also his second duel with Yugi, where he straight up threatens to kill himself if Yugi doesn't let him win. The only real change Kaiba makes is learning to use the heart of the cards, like Yugi constantly talks about. During his subsequent duel with Pegasus, he realizes Pegasus will always know what's in his hand, so he decides to go for broke and just draw and see what he ends up with. He even says he's putting all of his faith into the next card he draws, and then his faith rewards him with the blue eyes white dragon. He ends up losing the duel, but he's realized he needs to do something other than just talk smack and act tough. He needs to actually trust in the deck he's created and the individual abilities of each and every card in it. Which I suppose, now that I think of it, does make for something resembling a character arc of sorts, so well done. Joey is my absolute favorite character in this series. I've always loved how he goes from a complete novice to beating champion level Duel Monsters players. His first duel in the series is just a quick little fun matchup between him and Yugi in their classroom in the pilot. And his second to last duel in this arc is him humiliating the Duel Monsters Intercontinental Champion. Joey is whooping Bandit Keith's butt so bad, Keith has to resort to cheating and he still loses. His final duel in this arc is an official matchup with his best friend Yugi, who he almost beats. He was barely outplayed by a character who we later establish can pull whatever card he believes he immediately needs in the moment. Think about that. A character who can draw whatever card he thinks he needs, and Joey only loses 48 to 52. And this is a guy who only a week ago had a deck of only monster cards, who had zero trap and spell cards in his deck until trading a handful of them on the boat to Duel's Kingdom. This is the guy who beat the intercontinental champion of Duel Monsters and nearly lost out in becoming King of Games. You know what that is? It's well. It's not especially complicated, it's just Joey steadily learning to become a better player. A pretty typical shown anime arc. A young man realizes he has a skill or wants to become skilled at a particular trade, and we watch them steadily become better and better at it as time goes on. It's not a particularly original story when you really think about it, but honestly, who the hell cares? A good, well-told story is a good, well-told story. The only real quibble I have is that I think Joey's arc might have worked better thematically if he beat Yugi. But obviously the story calls for Yugi to win so he can face Pegasus and win back the souls of his grandfather and the Kaiba brothers. But on the flip side, this actually works for his arc in a different way. The two prizes for the tournament are a million dollars and a duel with Pegasus for the title of King of Games. When Joey loses, he offers Yugi the card that entitles him to the prize money, but Yugi immediately declines saying that he didn't come all the way here just to get rich, and that Joey needs that money to pay for his sister's operation. 
Joey in turn immediately bursts into tears because he absolutely needed every last penny to take care of his sister, and he'll now only be able to take care of her because of the kindness of his friend. And this is important. Joey showed earlier in the series that he has a big problem with people offering him their help. He doesn't want anyone to think he can't take care of himself. And outside of his arc as a duelist, his arc is learning how to accept it when your friends say they want to help you. They're not doing it out of pity, they're doing it because they care about you and that's what friends are for. So in the end, Joey losing to Yugi isn't as big of a deal because he won the most important things in the end. He won the courage to fight your own battles on your own, the strength you need to accept the help you need, and most importantly, he won money. Lots and lots and lots of money. For most of the Duelist Kingdom arc, Pegasus is just hiding in the shadows, influencing the behind the scenes, and observing the chaos. But once the Duelists enter the castle, you start to see some of the layers peel back for Pegasus, and you find that this isn't some psychotic maniac who does terrible things just for the lulls. He thinks that by combining the power of the Millennium Items with Kaiba's holographic technology, he'll be able to bring back his late wife. He knows he's being cruel and he doesn't care. He might be having fun while he's screwing with Yugi and Kaiba, but he's not doing this for the fun of it. This is strictly business. But what I really like about Pegasus is in addition to his camp attitude and twisted sense of humor, he's also a man of his word. He made a deal with Yugi. I win, I get your soul and your puzzle. You win, your grandpa and the Kaiba brothers get their souls back. And then when Pegasus loses, he just takes the L and follows up on their deal. Everyone is restored, everyone gets their prize. A deal is a deal. He's a man of his word. Overall, Duelist Kingdom is a lot of fun. The rules don't always make sense, but the story is pretty good. We meet lots of different characters throughout the arc, some who are selfish jerks without honor, some who are sadists who enjoy crushing people's dreams, and some are people with noble intentions who just want to make a better life with the prize money. We get a great arc of a young hero who goes from not understanding the power inside of him to fearing it, to embracing it, and actively controlling it. We get another great arc from an absolute novice who hates the idea of being babied, evolving into a skilled duelist who can match the best in the world tit for tat, in addition to learning to accept that a helping hand isn't someone saying you can't get up on your own. It's someone saying, hey, I'd like to help you get to your feet. We get to see a genuinely complex villain who gleefully does horrible things but does it from a place of grief and loneliness as opposed to genuine malice and hatefulness. Duelist Kingdom isn't exactly Full Metal Alchemist or a Studio Ghibli film, but it's a genuinely delightful piece of media that I'm really glad to watch. It's something cozy to me personally. If I'm bored and don't feel like watching something challenging or I'm in a bad mood and want to pick me up, I'll put this on and I'll just feel like maybe the role is pretty okay. That might seem like a funny thing to say about frickin' season one of Yu-Gi-Oh, but hey, it makes me happy. And I'm not sure there's anything else that needs to be said. 8 out of 10. An incredibly irritating little girl named Rebecca Hawkins comes to Domino City looking to start problems with Grandpa Moto because her own grandfather was the original owner of the fourth Blue Eyes White Dragon card, and she believes she's entitled to it. She and Yugi go back and forth for a few rounds, and Yugi decides to surrender the duel to teach her a valuable lesson about the heart of the cards. Nothing good comes of this. It's a waste of time that's not entertaining. It's pretty obvious from the reactions of other characters that Rebecca is meant to be annoying, but her being annoying on purpose doesn't make this episode enjoyable to watch. 5 out of 10, moving on. This is a fun bit of filler. It's much more consequential than the Rebecca arc, seeing as how the main villains of this arc come back for the filler arc at the start of Season 3. It's kind of weirdly placed though. I would have flipped this in the Rebecca arc, seeing as how seeing as how this seems to take place right after Duelist Kingdom. During the arc that started this show, five executives who helped run Seto Kaiba's company, Kaiba Corp, got it into their heads that the company might be on more solid ground if Seto wasn't in the picture anymore after his big loss to Yugi. However, the wrinkle in this plan was Kaiba has escaped every attempt at assassination and eventually came home from Pegasus Island, much to the Big Five's horror. So they go for their Hail Mary tactic, appealing to his ego. Uh, hey Kaiba, you know, uh, y you know that virtual reality game you wanted to make up and get running? Um. You want to check it out? Because we, 
We got it all set up for you, man. We It's all set, bro. Mokuba, knowing what show he's in, quickly sees through this blatant trap. Seto, however, being an egomaniac who enjoys being told how brilliant he is, falls for this, again, very blatant trap. He hooks his big brain up to that program, then gets locked into it and put into a virtual prison. Mokuba steals Kaiba's deck, runs off to find Yugi and his friends, they all agree to help, they sneak into the facility, hook themselves up to the VR sets, and eventually save Kaiba with Yugi and Kaiba, doing what would be the first of a few Dream Team matches. It's an obvious filler arc, but it's fun. 7 out of 10. And we have one last filler arc before we get into Season 2. The introduction of Duke Devlin, creator of Dual Monsters meets Craps, and probably the only Maximilian Pegasus to stand the entirety of fiction. Like, not just in this fictional universe, but I think in any fictional universe. Like, I'm pretty sure you can put on an episode of Atlanta and see Childish Gambino chatting up one of his buddies about Yu-Gi-Oh of all things, and neither Gambino nor his friend will likely ever say how cool Pegasus was for creating Duel Monsters. You can watch a random ass episode of Law & Order where a prospective witness works in a card shop or an anime store, and the younger cop will ask if they ever watched Yu-Gi-Oh as a kid, and they'll say, oh yeah, it was a good show, or Oh god, no, that show was terrible. But they will likely never say, Oh yeah, Max Pegasus was a genius. Duke Devlin is literally the only person in any fictional universe who stands Maximilian Pegasus. That said, while I find the story has an odd premise, I do enjoy the actual duels between Joey and Duke and then Yugi and Duke. Dungeon Dice Monsters does sound like a fun, if overly complicated, game. I wouldn't be surprised if this story was something the toy companies pitched to the producers when they needed to make filler arcs between Duelist Kingdom and Battle City. The ending of the arc even has all of the main characters go on about how cool and fun Dungeon Dice Monsters is, and how they love to play it again sometime. It really feels like this arc turned into a blatant commercial for a tie-in game that Konami made and was hoping they would make a quick buck off of because hey, it would work for the card game. Maybe we could spin it off into a dice game. Try to do Magic the Gathering, but with dice instead of playing cards. What's it? This was in Takahashi's original manga? What? It was published in 1999, two years before this episode aired in Japan? What the heck? Huh. Yeah, well, to be fair, it sounds to me, while the broad strokes are the same as the manga, it definitely seems like the anime feels a bit more toyetic than the description of the manga chapter on the Wikipedia page. But then again, you could easily say the same of many great parts of this series. But even so, I'm really struggling with the logic of Duke here. You're a cheater, Yugi, and to prove it, I'm gonna beat you at a game I personally created, and I'll do so by deliberately withholding information from you about how to play it. I'm sorry, what? How does that make sense, Devlin boy? I get that the guy is butthurt or because he wrote Pegasus, but he still ain't calling. But Give him a few more weeks, man. Even if he won, he'd probably need some time off after arranging an entire tournament, competing in two duels with very skilled opponents, maintaining security on his island, then arranging for the transfer of $3 million in 1999. That's gotta be a lot of work, even if you're, you're ignorant to his more malicious activities. Give the man some time to relax and recuperate, man. Come on. It's still a decent arc, though. 6 out of 10. There's about six episodes of build-up between the end of Season 1 and the proper beginning of the Battle City arc, and they're really only there to set the stage, but boy do they do it well. First you've got the two-parter of Yugi dueling a mind-controlled bandit Keith, and these two episodes do a really great job of setting up just how serious this villain is. Where Pegasus had his camp affect and giddy sense of humor, this guy Merrick is all business. There's no parlor tricks, it's just pure malice. Where Pegasus would remove people's souls from their bodies, this guy actively takes control of someone's body and suppresses their own will. The entire time we see Bandit Keith during Duelist Kingdom, we have a smart-mouthed jerk who's always had a snide comment ready and knew how to use his hands as well as his cards. Here, whenever we're given a look into what's going on in this guy's head, all you can hear is Keith quietly begging for help. This guy lost a Pegasus and all it did was make him more vicious, but this new villain has Keith acting like a little kid. Now what does that tell you? 
And then in episodes 3, 4, and 5, we see Kaiba and Yami be confronted with the idea that their rivalry may go back further than just Kaiba ripping up Grandpa Moto's Blue Eyes White Dragon card in the pilot much further, and therein we set up the idea that this arc will be about these characters and their pasts. For Yami, it's about rediscovering his past. He's been locked away in an ancient puzzle necklace for over 5,000 years. Whatever there is to know about who he is, before that, he doesn't remember it, and he'd really like to fix that. For Kaiba, it's about proving that his past does not define him. It's about drive, it's about, about power. power. It's about physically killing the past by creating a better present for himself with his new ultimate weapon, his Egyptian god card, Obelisk the Tormentor. With this new card in his deck, it's impossible for anyone to ever beat him because he'll be invincible with it. And then we finish this setup with good old Joey and what's going on in his world, which is to say, actually pretty nice. His sister is about to have her eye surgery and he's about to kick some butt in this new Battle City tournament. But, in the immortal words of Deadpool, life is a series of train wrecks with only brief commercial-like breaks of happiness. And now, it was back to our regularly scheduled programming. Merrick's rare hunters corner Joey and force him into a duel where they stomp into the dirt with frickin' Exodia. And then instead of just letting Joey gracefully hand over his right-eyes black dragon, they literally beat him up so they can take it from him by force, even after he said he'll just give it to them. They want to beat him up because they enjoy beating people in a duel and then beating them for real. But in typical Joey fashion, he still finds a way to get back on his feet and encourage his younger sister to go through with her operation so she can get her eyes fixed. Because as he's so fond of saying, Joey Wheeler is no quitter. An 8 out of 10 buildup for the main arc, a very strong start to the season. Let's see what the rest of the season is like. Following Joey's duel with the Rare Hunter in Episode 6, we get three multi-part dueling arcs each for Yugi and Joey. Yugi wins back Joey's Red Eyes Black Dragon from the Rare Hunter who took it before the tournament started. Joey beats a guy pretending to be a psychic. Then Yugi locks horns with a Rare Hunter with a whole magician gimmick. Then Joey goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Weevil Underwood, a minor villain from Season 1. Yugi then endures an assault from one of Merrick's puppets, who has the second Egyptian God card. And finally, Joey matches up with another Season 1 character in the form of Mako Tsunami. All fun duels that show Yugi slowly learning more and more about Merrick, the Rare Hunters, and the Egyptian God cards, who are in fact the most powerful cards in all of Duel Monsters. And they also show Joey slowly becoming an even better duelist. It's great stuff. We then see Joey and Taya get kidnapped, and this forces Yugi to team up with Kaiba when he's cornered by two rare hunters who want a two-on-one duel, but Kaiba intervenes because if anyone is going to be Yugi Moto, it's going to be him. Okay, I'm gonna use that clip again. That Kaiba kid needs to get laid. Big dude. Naturally, despite much bigger, and Kaiba's ego being bigger than the entire Eurasian continent, they eventually demolish these two chumps, which eventually leads to them finding Joey and Taya, who are... being controlled by Merrick. Tartar sauce. Yugi then faces Joey in a one-on-one -on -one battle without Yami's help this time, and with the caveat that the moment a player's life points reach zero, an anchor will drop to the bottom of the sea, taking either Yugi or Joey with them, while the winner can seize a key to set themselves free. And if either man tries to stop the duel, a crate hanging down over Taya's head will come crashing on top of her. <laughs> Yugi then does everything he can during the duel to make Joey break free from Merrick's control, and eventually, Joey does manage to power out, but by that point, Yugi decides he'd rather allow himself to be the one pulled down when the anchor finally drops, and allows Joey's final attack to go through, causing his life points to hit zero. On the flip side though, the special effect of Joey's card allows for one of Yugi's monsters to attack Joey back, so Joey's life points hit zero too. So Joey throws caution to the wind and foregoes saving himself in order to save Yugi. His sister then winds up saving his dim-witted behind, but it's a thought that counts, right? We get two more episodes before we get into the semi-finals. The first is a quickie where the spirit of the Corps' Millennium Ring, a character who first appeared in Season 1, but I never really discussed before because I didn't think it was that important at the time. Yami Bakura then steals some poor kid's dual disc and then steps up to Bones in a graveyard, Bones being another minor villain from Season 1 that I didn't mention, but he definitely gave Joey a run for his money in their duel. 
Yaipakura then stomps this little turd into the dust and then sends him off to the Shadow Realm, a mystical prison dimension full of horror and darkness. So basically a TVY version of hell, but anime. Following this supernatural creepiness, we follow up with some more average, everyday kind of creepiness. Some big shot movie star comes out to face Mai for her hand in marriage despite barely knowing the woman. And then when he loses, he tries to freaking kidnap this poor woman, but she's ultimately saved by Joey, so let's all be thankful for that. All in all, while the arc from episodes 7 through 29 definitely feel like one continuous story, the last two episodes just feel like something obligatory. We need eight bodies for the semifinals. We already know who four are, Joey, Yugi, Merrick, and Kaiba. So we need to fill out some of the other guys here before we get to the tournament venue. So it's just a quick reminder of how good Mai and Yami Bakura are. They are bad episodes, but I think single episodes just aren't terribly interesting to me, especially not at this point. So 8 out of 10 up until the last two episodes, then a slight dip to a 7.75 out of 10. Once we reach the arena, we learn of the last two people who made it to the quarterfinals, those being Merrick's sister Ishizu and Merrick's bodyguard Odion who will be posing as Merrick while Merrick himself poses as a sweet little friendly guy named Namu, a trick which Joey doesn't completely believe because Merrick was the one who controlled him and he still remembers the mind that he got from that sick freak. He still remembers what he felt when that man mind controlled him and forced him to hurt Yugi and he's not entirely sure that this guy calling himself Merrick is actually Merrick. And I'm not entirely sure why Merrick wanted to hide his identity, but here we fucking are. All the same, our arc is split up into four tournament duels and a fifth exhibition duel for the control of Merrick's body. Duel 1 is the least atypical of the bunch. Yugi defeats Yami Bakura in a pretty conventional duel. There's a brief moment at the end when Merrick tries to suggest that Yami Bakura play possum and let out the real Bakura and let him just cry about how much pain he's in. But Yami Bakura realizes that if Yugi does attack his vessel, his vessel is going to be injured and he decides he'd rather just take the L like a man. Duel 2 is when the shenanigans start. Joey goes head to head with Odeon who is still posing as Merrick. Joey starts the game a little sloppily, falling into a lot of Odeon's traps until he can finally summon Jinzo and nullify those traps. But then it all falls apart on him. Odeon brings out his monster, the Beast of Circuit who literally devours every monster Joey won in the tournament. Pretty straightforward so far. On the shenanigans! begin. Joey has no monster cards, no magic or trap cards, no anything to defend his life points, and Odeon has him dead to rights. But at the same time, Joey's started to openly question Odeon if he really is Merrick. So the real Merrick forces Odeon to play a copy of the Winged Dragon of Ra, Merrick's Egyptian god card. Odeon reluctantly agrees, only to get himself and Joey blasted by lightning. The duel is then decided by whoever can rise to their feet first, which in typical protagonist fashion turns out to be Joey. Odeon then falls into a coma and thus unleashes Merrick's even darker half. And if you thought the original Merrick was vile before, wait until you meet this freakazoid. And that first proper meeting turns out to be Yami Merrick versus My Valentine, which is also very shenanigan related. While Merrick spends most of the duel just using his shadow game bullcrap, in this case tying the memories of specific people to his and Mai's monsters. Whenever a monster is destroyed, the owner of said monster loses all memories of a specific person. Mai and Merrick have two monsters destroyed each in this battle, so Merrick loses all memory of Sting and Arcana to his servants who dueled against Yugi earlier in the season, while Mai loses all memory of Joey and their mutual friend Taya. Mai still rallies from this, however, and manages to steal Ra from Merrick via the special effects of one of her monsters. And this is where we get the true shenanigans because when my summons raw it's just a mechanical orb because apparently in order to actually use the winged dragon of raw you need to recite an ancient incantation on the card that can only be read by a select few 
a select few that my unfortunately is not part of. So despite sacrificing three monsters to give Raw a total attack power of 5400 points, she can't actually use it, but because Merrick does know the incantation, he recites it and regains control of the monster and blows my straight to hell. And then finally, for our last quarterfinal matchup, we have a Shizu versus Kaiba. Shizu being Merrick's sister and the woman who gave Obelisk to Kaiba along with the knowledge that he and Yugi knew each other 5,000 years earlier. This still follows along Kaiba's usual tactic of taunting his opponents while also steadily taking away their ability to fight back by using the same crush card he used against Yugi in Duelist Kingdom, plus an additional card that removes all of Shizu's magic cards from play. And this is where some mild shenanigans come in. Because of Ashizu's Millennium Necklace, she knows exactly what Kaiba is going to do before Kaiba even thinks of it, and has the ability to strategize accordingly. She invokes the power of a trap card, Exchange of the Souls, a card that means both players must swap the cards in their graveyard with the cards in their deck. This means Ashizu's deck is stacked, and Kaiba's deck consists of a whopping 6 cards. He only had 6 cards in his graveyard. But no matter, Kaiba still had obelisk in his hand, so he can go ahead and smash Shizu into the dirt. Except Shizu set up another trap. See, Kaiba had to sacrifice Shizu's monsters to summon obelisk, and she set up a bomb inside one of her monsters. A bomb which now resides inside obelisk. If Kaiba calls out an attack with obelisk, his monster and his life points are both history. And this is where we get some true SHENANIGANS! Because right when Kaiba is about to declare his attack, he gets a vision from Merrick's Millennium Rod, which makes Kaiba think that Obelisk may be the wrong call. So instead, he brings out one more monster, and then sacrifices it in Obelisk to summon his Blue Eyes White Dragon, which does not have a Shizu's Bomb in it, so Kaiba is free to obliterate her ass. Ashizu then decides to accept her life-changing L and hands her Millennium Necklace over to Yugi, figuring that she has no more use for it. We then move over to the spirit of the true Merrick, then repossessing Taya's body, his control over her having never been broken because he voluntarily relinquished it right before Yugi and Joey's duel. Merrick then uses Taya to give Bakura back the Millennium Ring and usher in the return of the ring's evil spirit. Merrick then approaches is Yami before and straight up says, Dude, I'm gonna bind. If you help me out, I'll leave you big time. Merrick and the spirit then confront Yami Merrick and tell him to square up. And square up the eviler Merrick does. And manages to pretty easily outflank Merrick and the spirit. Merrick and the spirit's ultimate strategy was to take the winged dragon of Ra from the other Merrick and use it against him by using a card combo that will move Ra from the evil Merrick's deck to the evil Merrick's hand to the spirit's hand. The spirit then sacrifices three decently powerful monsters and summons Ra, but here comes the twist. Evil Merrick uses a card that lowers the attack points of all sacrifice monsters to zero, and then adds those points to his life points, meaning Evil Merrick will now be even harder to take down. Additionally, this also means that because Ra's attack power is dependent on the three monsters used to summon it, when Ra is actually summoned, it only has zero attack points. The spirit then shrugs this off and decides to just use Ra as a sacrifice to summon a pretty above average monster. But this is where the Evil Merrick strategy pays off. You see, the card that the spirit used to take Ra in the first place was a magic card that meant the evil Merrick and the spirit got to trade one card from each person's hand, and so the card that Merrick took was Monster Reborn. So evil Merrick brings back Ra and activates another of its many, 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 many special abilities. That being, you can empower Ra by sacrificing your life points. So evil Merrick having a whopping 8,550 life points sacrifices all but one point to give Ra a devastating attack power of 8,549 points to the spirit and the good Merix 2,450 attack points. So, 
Bye guys! The original Merrick spirit is then weakened even further, and the body of Bakura is then blasted to the Shadow Realm along with the evil spirit of the ring, save for one little piece that he put inside the Millennium Puzzle at the start of the season. Our season then ends on a cliffhanger of the evil Merrick looking to kill Odeon so that his spirit can continue existing, but is spoiled by a Shizu and the original Merrick who can still possess Teya if he needs to. The quarterfinals is an extremely exciting arc. We're given intriguing character details about Merrick, Shizu, and even Odeon, who up until this point was just Merrick's mysterious servant, who you may not even really wondered about, but we're given a lot of insight into him, as well as some insight into Mai's backstory, which just makes her character even more tragic when the evil Merrick sends her mind to the Shadow Realm. We're given some more intriguing details about Kaiba and the Pharaoh's apparent connection, from 5,000 years ago, and while an argument could be made that introducing an even eviler Merrick was a confusing choice, and I would agree, but the thing is, well, the eviler Merrick is just plain awesome. Well, the original Merrick did have that marvelous sliper strategy and seemed to have a pretty solid idea of how to take down Yugi while controlling Joey. He was also getting to be a bit whiny. Evil or Merrick, in addition to being so much creepier, He's also just delightfully sassy. I especially love one particular joke he makes during his duel with the Spirit of the Millennium Ring. And the Spirit is arguing with the original Merrick, and the evil Merrick quips, It's so sad to see such good friends fight. And on that note, I really like how this is the first, and I think the only time where we've seen two characters who are both evil go head to head. And me personally, I've always really enjoyed villain fights. And so I think they're really fun. It's always great to see characters who don't care about being nice, don't care about being friendly, face off with each other. It's so exciting to me. So yeah, truly a delightful arc. 8.5 out of 10. Anyway, after all that chaos and talk about the mythical Shadow Realm and the mystical power of the Millennium Items, we begin Season 3 with... A... Return to the virtual reality crap from Season 1? What? What? Yeah, so the five big shot executives who tried to trap Kaiba in cyberspace after Duel's Kingdom, yeah, they're back, and they've teamed up with a mysterious boy named Noah to not only like, screw the Kaiba brothers again, but this time to steal their and at least three other poor suckers' his bodies. The names of those poor suckers? Oh, well, they gotta be either be Yugi Moto, Joey Wheeler, Serenity Wheeler, Tristan Taylor, Taya Gardner, or Duke Devlin. How will they steal these bodies? Well, they hooked them up to the virtual reality program again and forced each of them into a duel where the condition is if they lose the big five get their bodies because their own bodies are useless now because they've been stuck in virtual reality for so long on the flip side if everyone wins not only do they get to keep their bodies they'll eventually be let out of the program wait were we just doing duels fought in egyptian hell what the heck is going on here uh, well anyway, everyone gets split up by Noah and the Big Five. We have Mokubo and Seto together, Duke and Tristan following Serenity around, Yugi, Joey, and Taya each riding solo, and that's it. That's everyone. Following this, everyone is assigned an opponent who is appearing as a dual monster avatar to go with this half of the season's new dueling thing, the Deckmaster. Pretty much the same as a normal duel, but this time you get one extra monster to stand by your side or stand in your place during a duel who has a special ability. Said monster is your deck master and can only attack if you specifically move them onto the field, but if they're destroyed in battle, you will automatically lose the duel. So then, first up to bat, in typical protagonist fashion, is Yugi going up against Kaiba Corp Vice President of Business Strategy, Mr. Gansley, which Yugi wins in a fairly clean way. Well, Gansley's deck master has the ability to reflect attacks directed at his monsters back at Yugi's life points, Yugi is able to bypass this ability by combining his own deck master Karibo with the magic card Rainbow Blessing, which allows him to use his other monster on the field to attack Gansley directly, thus ending the duel. After that matchup, we get Taya versus former Kaiba Corp Chief Financial Officer Mr. Crump. Now, this duel, this duel features some more of those infamous shenanigans. Rump actually plays a pretty fair duel aside from leveraging the environment around him and Taya to his advantage. But when Taya calls her deck master, the Dark Magician Girl, to the field, 
who then uses her Deckmaster ability to allow Taya to draw four more cards for every monster in her graveyard. Taya then draws the card Sage's Stone, which lets her summon the Dark Magician proper from Yugi's deck. Because per this episode, the card says you can summon the Dark Magician from any nearby deck, which really bothers me so much more than it probably ought to. Just, I do not like this at all. All the same, with the power of the Dark Magician and the Dark Magician Girl, Taya blasts Crump back to the Penguin exhibit. Next up is Joey versus former Kaiba Corp Chief Legal Officer Mr. Johnson. This still features a bit more of the infamous shenanigans, but they're far less egregious in my opinion. You see, Joey has a handful of cards that operate purely on luck. Time Wizard, Skull Dice, Graceful Dice, and Gamble. Normally, Joey has pretty decent luck, but in this duel, Johnson is able to manipulate the outcomes in his own favor. Joey's dice cards roll 6, but then Johnson alters his roll into a 1, meaning Joey's graceful dice doesn't increase his monster's attack powers, and his skull dice doesn't decrease the attack power of Johnson's monster. This, however, is when Noah steps in and says that the duel is off because he wants to prove he's better than Kaiba by having his stooges actually beat their opponents fair and square. Joey, ever the proud Mary, insists they be allowed to finish their duel on the condition that Johnson be prohibited from cheating anymore. Noah shrugs and all but says it's Joey's funeral and the duel continues. Joey then comes in clutch with some good old bad and Wheeler Luck invokes the power of his Burning Soul magic card to empower his Flame Swordsman, and another magic card, Arduous Decision. Joey can draw two cards, a magic or trap card, and a monster card, and Johnson has to guess which card is the magic or trap card. If he guesses wrong, the monster card is used to invoke Burning Soul Sword's power to properly strengthen the Flame Swordsman, and guess wrong, Johnson does indeed. The last of his life points are blasted away by the Flame Swordsman, and yeah, I don't mind the shenanigans as much because the shenanigans are seen in-universe as cheating. It's not some mystical bullcrap. It's not a plot device to help a character that probably should lose win. It's a villain blatantly cheating, then getting scolded for it, and then having their butt kicked out of the courtroom. From there, we move on to... <sighs> Tristan Duke and Serenity versus former Kaiba Corp Chief Technical Officer, Mr. Nesbitt. Nesbitt knows out of the gate that Serenity knows the least about dueling, so he challenges her alone. So Tristan immediately tries to be Serenity's knight in shining armor by volunteering to duel him instead. Duke just wants to protect the novice Serenity and the dim-witted Tristan by dueling for the both of them, but Nesbitt insists that his target is only Serenity. And so the boys make a compromise, three on one. Them and Serenity versus him. And based on my prior assessment, you can already guess how this duel is going to go. Serenity is going to make rookie mistake after rookie mistake for the whole game. Tristan is going to defend her by playing badly on purpose. And Duke is going to try and end this quickly by actually playing strategically because he actually knows how to play freaking duel monsters. So eventually, Tristan loses the duel because he focused on protecting Serenity instead of winning the duel. But thankfully, it's Serenity who ultimately wins the duel. Happy endings all around, and Nesbitt is taking Tristan's body anyway. Uh, of course he is. Fuck. Well then, we follow up on Tristan as Nesbitt, with the former CTO kidnapping Mokuba. Seto of course runs after him, but instead bumps into the fifth member of the Big Five, Lecter. The right-hand man of Seto's father, goes with Borokaiba, who of course challenges him to a duel. Pretty normal, but the problem here is Lecter's deck master is Jinzo, a monster with the power to destroy trap cards. It's a tricky fight, but Kaiba pulls out a win by playing his trump card, the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Lecter had already played a card that had zero attack points, but gained 1,000 more points with each turn after it's summoned. But that's each of Lecter's turns. Otherwise, the card still has zero points during Kaiba's turns. So one shot from old blue eyes, and it's game over for executive number five. Following this matchup, we get the big explanation about why Noah arranged all of this crap anyway. Noah 
is the biological son of the man who adopted Seto and Mokuba. Noah is Seto and Mokuba's adoptive brother. Gozaboro adopted Seto specifically to serve as a challenge for Noah. Gozaboro saw how smart Seto was and decided that having him around would force Noah to actually grow as a person, to actually develop some ambition, and would ultimately make him worthy of inheriting his company. That's what Noah's story is, but Kaiba doesn't buy it, but before Noah can explain further, he leaves to deal with the Big Five, who never got a body, and who are now trying to take Joey, Duke, and Serenity's bodies by force. In the next episode, Noah decides to arrange for a five-on-one duel. All five members of the Big Five will use Tristan's body in a duel against Yugi. If they win, they can take the pot. Yugi, Joey, Tristan, Serenity, Duke, Taya, anybody they want, they're theirs. If they lose, they have to give Tristan his body back and they will be forced to wander the virtual world forever. Yugi, ever the big hero, accepts the duel without question, but Joey, ever the proud Mary, volunteers to be Yugi's partner. Johnson, thinking Joey a weaker duelist, accepts his offer on behalf of his colleagues. Johnson is, of course, an overconfident doofus who refuses to stop talking in legalese, so what the hell does he know? This still goes back and forth for the first half of the game, with neither side gaining a definitive edge until Lecter draws out their final boss monster, the Berserk Dragon. The Berserk Dragon issues an attack against Yugi, but it fails thanks to Joey's Silver Dollar Trap Card, a card which protects monsters with 1,000 attack points or less, which Joey's Flame Swordsman had thanks to using up most of his attack points earlier to power up Joey's other monsters. So the Swordsman took the blast with a Dark Magician, and then, upon Joey's turn, he plays the magic card Knight's Title, turning the Dark Magician into a warrior-type monster, giving the Flame Swordsman the ability to power up the Dark Magician, making Yugi's monster go from 2,500 points to a pretty decent 3,200 points, making him just strong enough to take down the Berserk Dragon, who only had a comparatively weaker 3,000 attack points. Game over, boys. Naturally, unsatisfied with their continued failure, Noah disposes of the Big Five once and for all, and decides it's time to actually step into the spotlight and challenges Seto to see who the stronger Kaiba brother really is. During this duel, Noah finally explains the reason why all three Kaiba brothers were never raised together. Just before Mokuba and Seto were sent to live with Gozaboro, Noah was in an unfortunate accident that destroyed most of his body. But his salvation came from Gozaboro digitizing his mind and putting him into a virtual reality to live in. Eventually though, while Gozaboro had originally intended for Noah to inherit Kaiba Corp, he ultimately decided it just made more sense to have Seto inherit it while Noah just did Noah things in his little virtual world. Who cares about the dead boy? Ultimately though, Noah does prove to be the stronger son when he reduces his eldest brother to a mere 400 life points and boosts himself to over 7,000 before turning Seto and Mokuba into stone out of spite. Yugi then decides to step in because turning a man to stone instead of just winning doesn't seem right to him. In the end, Yugi pulls a win out by using the perfect six card combo. Seeing as how at the start of the duel, Yugi combined his deck with Seto's, he had access to the blue eyes white dragon that Noah had destroyed earlier. So he brings it back with Monster Reborn, uses it with the other two blue eyes, from Kaiba's deck to create Blue Eyes White Ultimate Dragon. He then uses the Magic Card Quick Attack to blow Noah's monster to hell. Then, with his Diffusion card, he uses all three Blue Eyes White Dragons to attack Noah's life points directly. This means Noah goes from 10,400 life points to 8,700 life points to zero. Game over. Following this, we get a look at the real mastermind of this entire operation, the late great Gozaboro Kaiba. Seto runs off to confront the old man, who challenges him to a duel. The winner gets Seto's body. Meanwhile, Noah escapes to the real world with Mokuba's body and sets up the digital world to self-destruct, but the last moment changes his mind. Unfortunately, the previous Arx villain got jealous from not being paid attention to and decided to remind us all that he is going to be the next Arx villain too. Because it's my show, bitch! He reminds us all about this by destroying the actual keyboard of the computer hooked up to the virtual world that could potentially cancel this self-destruct sequence. 
So Noah decides to do the right thing by warning everyone that the virtual world will soon be destroyed. Naturally, Seto wastes no time in summoning his blue eyes white dragon and blasts Gozaboro straight to hell, and just in time to be rescued by Yugi and Noah. Once everyone is free, Seto says exactly what the writers of this anime were thinking as soon as Takahashi had finished writing the Battle City arc of the manga. Alright, this little detour has proved to be a complete waste of my time and effort, so let's just move on and pretend that this nonsense never happened. And it's back to Battle City, baby! Obvious filler is obvious, but on the whole, this was a really entertaining arc. I really liked how it put all of Kaiba's... well, everything, into context. His attitude, his personality, his general demeanor, his cutthroat attitude about a freaking card game, his complete love and devotion for his little brother. All of that is put under a microscope and analyzed, and we see exactly why he is the way he is. The only thing I'd really comment on at this rate is the fact that at a certain point Yugi's speech is about love and friendship, and they can get a little tedious to be quite honest. Still a really entertaining arc though, so I'm gonna say 7.75 out of 10. Following all of that mess in virtual reality, we return to the land of Battle City and Merrick's satanic Egyptian powers. The arc following the Final Four Duelist Kingdom contenders begins with a battle royal between Joey, Merrick, Kaiba, and Yugi. All four contenders are in elevated pods that will steadily go up Kaiba's duel tower as the duelists lose their life points. When you hit zero, you reach the top, and the first two there are going to be the first semifinal duel of the tournament. And the first two to reach the top turn out to be Merrick and Joey, setting up for an epic bloodbath between a man out for revenge and a man out for violence. Keeping with this theme, Joey fights a pretty great duel where Merrick just keeps relying on being an evil magician who does evil magic thing. Merrick eventually brings out his winged dragon of raw and blasts Joey with it, but there's a small problem. He brought it back with Monster Reborn, meaning Ra could only stay on the field for one turn, and then when Merrick disappears, Joey still has life points, and Merrick is wide open for an attack, and Merrick is shitting bricks. Unfortunately, thanks to Merrick's shadow magic, Joey only has enough energy to summon one last monster, but not to actually call out an attack. It's a spectacular duel with an especially emotional climax that will absolutely make you throw your remote at your TV, make you snap your laptop in half, smash your tablet, or throw your smartphone across the room, because the finish is just that infuriating. Next up is a grudge match that's been waiting since the end of the 24th episode of this freaking show. Yugi vs. Kaiba 3, the duel of the century. A duel filled with drama, pettiness, ancient Egyptian shenanigans, and tit-for-tat moves. The first half of the whole duel is them trying to summon their Egyptian god cards, stopping each other from summoning them, actually summoning their Egyptian god cards, depowering each other's Egyptian god cards, repowering them, and then finally destroying each other's Egyptian god cards. The duel finally ends with Yugi summoning Joey's Red Eyes Black Dragon and fusing his Dark Magician with his Buster Blader to summon the Dark Paladin. Then, he uses his Diffusion Magic card to split the Blue-Eyes White Ultimate Dragon into Kaiba's three original Blue-Eyes White Dragons. The Dark Paladin started with an attack power of 2,900 points, but he gets an extra 500 attack points for every dragon on the field, giving him a whopping 4,900 attack points. Kaiba has 1,900 life points so far, so after one attack, he's knocked out of his own tournament. Game over. From here, we move over to Kaiba throwing himself a pity party, and Joey trying to cheer him up, but instead they end up irritating each other so much that they end up dueling. Which Joey loses, but he still gets to control Kaiba's Blue Eyes White Dragon for a turn, which almost made Kaiba have a seizure on the spot, so in the end, did he really lose? Which leads us into Yugi vs. Merrick, or rather, Yami versus Merrick, because this time Merrick's shadow game has an interesting twist. For every life point Yami loses, little Yugi will lose a portion of his soul to the shadow realm. And for every life point the evil Merrick loses, the more of the original Merrick will be lost too. If Yami loses, he loses Obelisk, Slifer, his puzzle, and his body. If the evil Merrick 
loses, then his better half is gone forever. Eventually, the duel comes down to the evil Merrick summoning the Winged Dragon of Ra, using the same trick he pulled on Bakora for the win, that being attributing all but one life point to give Ra an attack power of 4,899 points. But Yami and Yugi pull a Hail Mary and decides to destroy Merrick's Egyptian God card by hitting him with the power of the Norse Apocalypse by playing the magic card Ragnarok. However, before Yugi and Yami can complete this move, a recovering Odeon arrives on the scene to plead with the real Merrick to resist his darker half. The Merrick, in this moment, realizes he does have power over his darker half and wrestles for control of his darker half, while the Pharaoh and that good kid from Domino City complete their move. Following this, the original Merrick and the evil Merrick have switched places, with the original Merrick standing in the flesh while his evil half is most consumed by the Shadow Realm. Despite his evil half's desperate pleas, Merrick decides to put an end to the duel, and him, and all of this madness, by surrendering and willingly giving the Pharaoh the Winged Dragon of Ra. Following this, my Duke and Serenity all head back to their homes, and Joey and Yugi meet up for one more duel for Joey to earn back his Red Eyes Black Dragon. Battle City is a really terrific arc. The duels are excellent, the character interactions are superb. The second to last episode ending with Yugi and Joey facing off, it really does just kill me. It's just more effortlessly entertaining for kids anime, and I'm loving it more and more. 8 out of 10. Following all of that ancient Egyptian craziness, we get into some anime original craziness. This is likely because Takahashi was still writing the finale to the manga in 2003 when this arc began airing in Japan, and when your show is a smash hit but the material isn't yet complete, you can either take the Game of Thrones and Full Metal Alchemist 2003 approach and say, eh, screw it, and write yourself a completely new ending, or you can just stall for time with your own original stories. And anime writers do this a lot. It's why you had the Big Five arc at the start of Season 3, instead of just immediately finishing up the Battle City arc from the season before. Anyway, this craziness starts with Yami deciding to take the Egyptian God cards to the museum in Domino City to see if showing them to the tablet can unlock his memories. Unfortunately, it just causes a lot of really weird stuff to happen inside the museum and outside a whole bunch of creatures from the Duel Monsters card game appear alive in the flesh? What? The craziness continues even further when a trio of bikers steal the god cards from Yugi who was then challenged to a duel by some weird old man in a dark cloak. We then go from craziness to absolute insanity when this guy plays a field magic card called the Seal of Orichalcos. The effects of this card are they add 500 attack points to every monster on the summoner side of the field, allows for monsters to be played in the Magic and Trap card zone. The card cannot be removed from play either by the user or the opponent. Outside of interference is a no-go. And finally, whoever loses the duel once the seal is in play will also lose their soul. Oh yeah, and uh, the ancient magic that created this seal, it predates the magic of the Millennium Items. The seal of Orichalcos is older than Yami. Following that revelation, the old man decides to turn the insanity up to 11 by sacrificing three monsters to summon Obelisk the Frickin' Tormentor, making Obelisk's insane amount of power even greater. Yugi does eventually manage to surmount an offense and take this old guy down, but before he can recover his card, the old man tosses it to the bikers who stole them in the first place before his soul is claimed by the seal. After this, Rebecca Hawkins and her grandfather, Arthur, return to Domino City to explain that they have rediscovered Atlantis, and they believe that the magic of this seal may likely be connected to it. Later that night, though, Yugi and the Pharaoh share a vision of themselves meeting the Dark Magician Girl in a realm entirely populated by creatures from Duel Monsters. Dark Magician Girl then points Yugi and Yami to three ice sculptures of dragons and tells them to pull a sword from one of them. The one they pull from is named Tamias and is then freed from the ice. Upon awakening from their dream, they see the eye of a great beast in the sky and on instinct pull out Tamias and use him to blast back whatever the heck this thing is to wherever the heck it came back from. This seemingly puts an end to the conflict for now until they receive another video message from the one and only Maximilian Pegasus. Pegasus tells Yugi to come and meet him in San Francisco so that they can put a stop to whatever the hell is happening right now. Unbeknownst to Yugi, Pegasus's soul is then claimed by the one and only 
my Valentine? Following this, though, an imposter posing as Pegasus sends a message to Kaiba, following the revelation that someone has been buying up stock in Kaiba Corp, possibly plotting a hostile takeover. The Pegasus impersonator promises Kaiba that he'll stop trying to take over his company if Kaiba comes out and agrees to face him in a rematch. Kaiba reluctantly agrees and quickly notices Pegasus is basically just replaying the exact same strategy he used against him in Duelist Kingdom. Upon realizing the jig is up, the Impositor forgoes his disguise and reveals his true identity, a young man named Alistair who is one of the bikers who stole the Egyptian god cards from Yugi, and also has a bit of a grudge against the Kaiba family. More specifically, he has a grudge against Kaiba's father, Gozaboro. You see, before Kaiba Corp was a gaming company under Seto, it was a weapons manufacturer under Gozaboro, and a lot of those weapons, they were used to destroy Alistair's hometown and wound up killing his, his entire family. And in my mind, the fact that Kaiba's company and his wealth originated from selling weapons to the people that took his family away from him, in his mind, Kaiba is as much to blame for his misfortunes as his father was, and he needs to pay with his soul for taking his little brother from him. In a refreshingly out-of-character moment, Kaiba freely admits Alistair has every right to be angry with his father. The man was a monster, but that doesn't give Alistair the right to take it out on him, especially when he's gone out of his way to remove himself and his company from Gozaboro's legacy. Ultimately though, Alistair does manage to put Kaiba on the ropes, until Kaiba is greeted with a vision similar to Yami and Yugi's. He's floating inside a castle with now two ice sculptured dragons. The voice of the dark magician girl then tells Kaiba to pull a sword from one of them. Kaiba reluctantly does so, then snaps back to reality with his hand on his deck about to draw a card. The card he draws? The Fang of Critias, the very same dragon he just freed in his vision moments ago. Kaiba then summons Critias and fuses it with his crush card virus trap? Somehow that works and Kaiba manages to put Alistair on his back foot, realizing that he can't win but losing means losing his soul, Alistair decides to throw the towel in and plays a trap card that makes the duel a tie. So, when they both hit zero life points, the seal blasts them both away, but everyone still has their soul. Alistair then runs off and is nowhere to be seen. So, Kaiba and Mokova decide to be on their way, with Kaiba thinking he ought to go and find where Pegasus really is because he is the only man who could know anything about how the heck Critias wound up in his deck. Meanwhile, Yugi and the gang head out to San Francisco to meet up with Pegasus and see exactly what it is he wanted to tell Yugi. But when they arrive at the HQ for Pegasus' company Industrial Illusions, all of the phones are down and the building locks down as soon as they enter, and they are greeted with the arrival of a now claimed by the dark side, My Valentine, who immediately challenges Joey to a duel, and she whips his butt at it until Joey takes control of the third legendary dragon card, the Claw of Hermos. Joey then combines Hermos with his Time Wizard to create an accessory card to add to his Speed Mega Cyber. This combo then allows Joey to send each of my monsters to a certain number of turns into the future. Two attacks later, and Joey drops Mai down to 450 life points to his 200 even. Joey's plan now is to basically force a tie so that no one's soul can be claimed by the seal. But one of the bikers, a jolly good Englishman named Valen, decides he doesn't want to risk Mai losing, likely because he has a huge crush on her, and uses his portion of the Orichalco stone to unlock the steel and render the duel a no contest. Following this, Yuki and the gang meet up with the Kaiba brothers and Duke Devlin, along with Weevil Underwood and Rex Raptor of all people. Once together, they decide to scope out the Industrial Illusions HQ to find a message from Pegasus catching up the main cast on what's coming. A man named Darts is the one leading these bikers, and behind all of this crap with the Seal of Orichalcos. His ultimate plan is to gather enough souls to bring about the return of a beast known as the Great Leviathan. In Pegasus' message, he offers Yugi a one-of-a-kind card to help him in his battle against Dark, a card which appears blank, but Yugi decides to hold on to just in case. Following all this chaos, Kaiba runs off with Mokuba for parts unknown, while Yugi and the gang head out to meet with the Hawkins family. Unfortunately, 
Professor Arthur was just kidnapped by Raphael and Valen in an effort to lure the Pharaoh into a duel, a trap which Yugi willingly walks into because by the time he actually arrives, Raphael has already let the Professor go. Raphael specifically wants to duel the Pharaoh because he wants to prove that the Pharaoh is actually the evil one between him and Darts. Yami doesn't want to believe it, but Raphael's words shake him to his core. And what shakes him even more is when the power of exchange is invoked. The only card you can trade Raphael is the seal of Orikalkos. Eventually, Yami realizes the only way for him to possibly win this duel is to invoke the seal's power, which he does despite Yugi's begging and pleading. Eventually, Yami loses the duel anyway, but seeing as how they are two souls in one body at the last possible second, Yugi's soul pushes away Yami's to let himself be the one claimed by the seal. And this is the first time we see Yami really lose it. No dignified righteous fury, he's fallen right into the dirt and is screaming to the heavens in guilt and pain. Ah! It should have been me, not him! It's not fair! It is absolute cinema. This is especially impactful because it is the first time in this series where Yami and Yugi just straight up lose. They didn't give up, like with his match against Rebecca after Duelist Kingdom. He didn't fail to make an attack in time because of a time limit, like his first duel against Pegasus. And he didn't have a win clinched but stopped the attack at the last second because he thought his opponent would hurt himself if they lost, like with Kaiba in Duelist Kingdom. Yugi straight up did the job for Raphael. This feels like the Yu-Gi-Oh equivalent to John Cena losing to CM Punk at Money in the Bank 2011, or Rob Van Dam beating John at ECW One Night Stand in 2006. Hell, it might even be comparable to Brock Lesnar absolutely slaughtering John at SummerSlam 2014. And to be very clear, yes, I am absolutely 100% saying that the Pharaoh is the John Cena of anime. <laughs> Following this duel, though, the gang then decides to board a train out to Florida to see if they can actually confront Darts and stop him before it's too late. And also because these Japanese creators aren't familiar with how slow and expensive Amtrak is compared to just booking a flight. And on the flip side of that plotline, we catch up with two characters who I haven't really mentioned that much, those being Weevil Underwood and Rex Raptor. Rex and Weevil once upon a time were serious threats, with Rex being one of Joey's first challenges in Duelist Kingdom, and Weevil being the little snake who threw out Yugi's Exodia cards on the way to Duelist Kingdom. Now though, they're basically comic relief villains who no one takes seriously anymore, and they know that, and they hate it. So they've thrown in with darts and are each challenging the person who basically was there at the start of their respective careers being flushed down the toilet. In other words, Rex squares up with Joey, and Weevil goes head to head with the Pharaoh. These are decisions that both of these boys live to regret when their souls are claimed by the seal. Following the Pharaoh and Weevil's duel, the train ends up flying off the tracks, leaving Tristan, Joey, and Rex behind, while Taya and Yami venture out into the wilderness to find some help, with Weevil having disappeared. The duo then meet an old man named Ironheart and his granddaughter Chris, who helps Yami accept his mistake and give him the confidence he needs to face darts. On the flip side, Duke and Rebecca decide to drive out to Florida themselves, the professor, to actually translate the Atlantis exhibit. Yami and the gang were heading out to Florida to check out to learn more about darts before they confront him, but they stop when they see Valen and Mai hanging out on the side of the road. Rebecca, who has a massive crush on Yugi, decides she wants some payback and challenges Valen to a duel, which she accepts. Duke, not wanting Rebecca to lose her soul, decides to make it a two-on-one affair, which Valen also accepts. Valen then promptly wipes the floor with the both of them and tells them that Joey is next. Following all of this, we catch up with Kaiba and Mokuba on board their Kaiba Corp jet, and then it turns out that Alistair has commandeered the jet because what else is he gonna do? He then challenges Kaiba to a duel, and it doesn't go well for him. Oh well. Later on, Valen meets up with Joey and challenges him to a duel with the unique twist that Valen does not duel with conventional monster cards, but pieces of power armor that act as monster cards. Eventually, Joey takes the hint, and this duel turns into a full-on street fight with both guys punching each other in the face while wearing power armor until finally, poor Valen's soul gets claimed by the seal of Orichalcos. Mai, a little fed up with all of these men fighting over her instead of just letting her 
make her own choices, challenges Joey to a duel immediately after he's finished off Valen, and Mai eventually drops Joey down to 200 life points with no monsters or face down guards to protect himself. But instead of attacking, Mai finally wakes up and realizes what it is she's doing and refuses to attack Joey, but Joey is too exhausted to continue and loses by forfeit leading to the Orichalcos claiming his soul. Mai then decides it's time to pay darts back for manipulating her and hurting her friends, and picks up Paramos with the hope of avenging Joey. Instead, however, she winds up having the seal claim her soul thanks to Raphael, right as Yugi and Kaiba show up at Darts' front door. Conveniently though, Raphael is itching for a rematch after Yugi's soul was claimed instead of the Pharaoh's. A rematch which Yami wins this time in a match more akin to Brock vs. Cena at Extreme Rules 2012 than Brock vs. Cena at SummerSlam because the Pharaoh will always rise above hate and never give up. However, Yami isn't the only one who rose above hate. Yami managed to convince Raphael to let go of his hatred and inner darkness so that when he lost the duel, he did not lose his soul. Following this, Raphael gives Yami the key to actually getting into Darts' stronghold while he sticks around to make sure Mai and Valen will actually be okay when their souls return to them. Because now, Kaiba and Yami are about to head out and teach Darts a lesson he won't forget. Or at least... That was the plan. The execution gets to be a bit fuzzier. Inside the first five turns of this duel, Yami and Kaiba manage to summon their ultimate monster, the card they used to beat the big five back in season one, Dragon Master Knight, a creature with 5,000 attack points. Yami attacks immediately, and it does absolutely nothing thanks to the special effects of Darts' monster, Orikalto Skutora, a monster with the ability to absorb all attack damage. Darts further ups the ante by adding a second and third layer to the Orichalcos. Orichalcos Deuteros, which gives him 500 extra life points once per turn for every monster on his side of the field for a whopping final total of 20,000 life points and prevents his life points from being targeted directly. And Orichalcos Tritos, which prevents Yugi and Kaiba from playing magic and trap cards that target Darts' as monsters. Darts even manages to put enough pressure on this dream team that he manages to take out Kaiba and claim his soul. Yami eventually figures out a way to win by summoning the legendary dragons and using Pegasus's card to bring about their true forms, the legendary Knights of Atlantis. With their combined power, Yami eventually manages to defeat Darts. This manages to bring back Kaiba, Joey, and Yugi, but there's still work to be done. Since Darts needed the Pharaoh's soul to summon the Leviathan, he decided to just say screw it and use his own soul instead. Getting past the Leviathan does prove to be pretty tricky, but Yami plays the trump card, bringing out his now recovered Egyptian god cards. Finally, once Darts and the Leviathan are taken care of, Yami now has to put away his own inner darkness to finally triumph over the Orichalcos, which he does and then turns around and purifies Darts' heart back to the way it was before the Orichalco stones ever arrived in Atlantis. All is well again, and the story is over. The Waking the Dragons arc is a bit unique in that it's the first and only time where the entire season is just one arc. I think the final battle with Darts just goes on way too long. You think he's beaten, then Yugi, Joey, and Kaiba have to go out and fight them all over again. And then you think, now he's done. Now we can go home. Then Yami has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him one more godforsaken time. This is still a really good arc, though. I just think that the final confrontation with Darts just, again, goes on way too long. I think it might actually drag down the rest of the season for me. But that said, the duels between Raphael and Yami and Valen and Joey's Slugfest, they are both big highlights. These are the most exciting duels of the season, and while it's a little embarrassing to see Rex and Weevil be reduced to just the bulk and skull of Yu-Gi-Oh, their actual arc in this season is actually pretty interesting and kind of tragic. They used to be these big time hotshots that everyone feared and respected, but then the main characters came in and kicked their butts. And you never really took the time to think for now about what becomes of the two big time hotshots when they finally take an L. And it turns out what happens is everyone that you stepped on and bullied now realizes they have the power to step on and bully you, and it hurts. 
doesn't it? Plus, specifically on the Joey front, I like how this time around, Joey isn't specifically portrayed as someone who just doesn't understand what's going on or what he's doing. He doesn't fully understand what his opponents are doing, but that's just because, my, he just doesn't understand what she's doing, period. Not just within the context of dual monsters. And with Valen, well, who the heck uses power armor as their monster cards? In the first half of Duel's Kingdom and the first half of Battle City, Joey kept being shown as being out of his deck and kept winning off of pure luck. Here, while getting Hermos in his duel against Mai is pure luck, it's not luck like his dice rolls, it's luck like the universe itself has decided Joey Wheeler needs to win this duel, and when he does in the end. And while we're at it, you know, it was really starting to bug me that in Duelist Kingdom, it was mostly about Yugi and his character growth, but Battle City didn't really show any growth for Yugi or Yami. Here, though, this storyline is very much about Yami realizing I'm not the center of the universe. Because while Yami is awesome, and he is extremely awesome, he really is, he's not always right. He is fallible, he can make mistakes, and he makes a huge one in his first duel against Raphael. And for the rest of the season, even if that mistake isn't actively weighing on Yami, it's still constantly in the back of his mind. It's still in the back of his head that Yugi begged him and pleaded with him not to play the seal. And then he did anyway, and then he lost, and then it was Yugi who had to suffer because of his mistake. And all the way up to the end, the Pharaoh has to keep paying for it. He kept having to redeem himself even after he got Yugi back, because neither he nor the writers think Yami should be let off the hook. So in the end, I'm going to give the Oriakalkos arc a 7.75 out of 10. It's really good stuff. Season 5 is the end of the road for Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters. For me, it's been an absolute blast from start to finish, but in the immortal words of Victor Stone, the ride ain't over yet. Because following all of that chaos over the blasted seal of Ori Kalkos, Kaiba finally has his own theme park up and running. The wonderful world of Kaiba Land. And he wants to do a tournament to commemorate it. And who does he pick for it? Well, Joey's in it. Rebecca's in it. Yugi's grandpa is in it. Yugi himself will defend his title as King of Games against the winner. And then we got... Um... A, a whole bunch of weirdos with strange gimmicks. Man, Kaiba's... Kaiba Corp's reputation really did sink during season. Or if this was the best he could do, good lord. Anyway, our first match of the tournament is Joey versus Mr. Moto, and oh wait, one more thing. Uh, for some reason, Solomon Moto decided to just wear a mask and not publicly reveal his identity prior to this duel. It's it's very strange. I don't get why Solomon did this. I don't get why the original Japanese writers for this anime plotline put it in the story, and I don't get why the writers for Four Kids decided to keep it in. It's such a strange choice. I don't understand it. But anyway, Solomon versus Joey is a pretty darn good duel, and we get to see exactly where Yugi and Joey got their skills from, and it's pretty heartwarming to hear Mr. Moto tell Joey that the student has most definitely surpassed the master. And we then move on to Rebecca versus a Chinese influencer named Vivian Wong? Okay. It's actually a pretty solid duel as far as one episode duels go. It's a really good back and forth with Rebecca ultimately controlling most of the action and scoring W ultimately. Next up we have what was supposed to be some rich German guy with pink hair versus some guy who looked like a druid, but then Rex and Weevil came back to do their bulk and skull routine and locked the poor druid guy up in the supply closet. They walk out with the druid guy's duel and immediately get exposed and are about to be kicked out by Mokuba when the German guy says, Meh, I am already here. We may as well have some fun. Let some do it here, Mokuba. Mokuba basically says, well, okay, it's your funeral. But instead, it turns out to be Rex and Weevil's funerals because this German fella slams these boys harder than Gebhard Liebrecht von Blucher slammed Napoleon Bonaparte at the Battle of Waterloo. 
Let me put this into perspective. Beevil's first turn was summoning his Insect Queen, and Rex's was summoning Black Tyranno. So that's a monster with 2200 attack points and a monster with 2600 attack points. And then the Sherman guy's first move was winning the entire match. So what's up next? Oh yeah, it's just Joey versus Siegfried Lloyd, the exact same German guy who just mopped the floor here. Interestingly, it seems like this Siegfried Bella has a secret hidden agenda because for the first half of his match with Joey, he is completely ignoring him just so we can look at the camera and ponder if Kaiba knows what he's up to. This infuriates Joey to no end, so by his fourth turn, the old Wheeler Lock finally rears its head as Joey summons his Jinzo and blasts away half of Ziggy's life points. And this German guy doesn't like that. Not one bit. So, when Siegfried plays the card that demolished Tweedledee and Tweedledum with Ride of the Valkyries, a card which summons four Valkyrie cards to the field, the effect of these cards being one automatically destroys any monster on Joey's side of the field, then the effect of another one of the monsters is that they take on the attack power of whatever monster was just destroyed in battle. So, all four monsters attack Joey directly for a whopping total of 7,200 points of damage. And that's game. Or so the German guy would assume, because right before damage calculation, Joey activated his magic card Hyper Refresh, a card which doubles his life points right before he takes any damage. So instead of being 4,000 points minus 7,200 points for a grand total of negative 3,200 points, it's 8,000 minus 7,200 points for a whopping total of 800 life points. The duel continues with a very back and forth contest, with Siegfried managing to take away several of Joey's best monsters, but never managing to make Joey lose any life points. Eventually, Joey manages to whittle this German fella down to just 100 life points. But here's the part where he screws up. He has the opportunity to put the duel away on his last turn, but he decides to just play a magic card and call it good for now. And that's when our German friend snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. Siegfried plays a magic card, which boosts his monster's attack power by 500 for every monster of Joey's that he destroyed. The German man had destroyed five of Joey's monsters. So five times 500 is 2,500, and 2,500 plus 2,500 is 5,000. Well, Joey, his monster, has a normally pretty great 3,100, but 5,000 minus 3,100 is a lot more than 800 life points. So, Joey goes for a Hail Mary on his trap card, but he fails, and the German guy takes the win in what was a pretty impressive performance from both duelists. We then move over to Rebecca versus a little fella I haven't been focusing on by the name of Leon Wilson. And the thing about Leon is, he's deceptively good. He's got a very strange fairy tale themed deck, but it doesn't really matter how strange it is because he actually manages to kick Rebecca's ass. And then our tournament finale is settled. It's Siegfried Lloyd versus Leon Wilson. Or at least it would be if Kaiba hadn't just figured out who the heck Siegfried is. Because Siegfried Lloyd is not Siegfried Lloyd. He is actually Siegfried von Schroeder, the head of Kaiba Corp's main rival in the gaming industry, Schroeder Corp. And Siegfried's been hacking into Kaiba Land's systems since the beginning of this arc and causing chaos all over the place since before Kaiba even officially started this tournament. So Kaiba moves to have Siegfried thrown out, but Siegfried makes an appeal to Kaiba's ego and says he doesn't want him to be thrown out because he's a lying trespasser. He wants him thrown out because he thinks Siegfried could beat Leon and then beat Yugi and become king of games. And if Siegfried is the king of games, oh Kaiba can never win his title back not ever! Kaiba naturally sees right through Siegfried's trick, but still agrees to the duel because he feels like humiliating this little jerk a bit. And after another back and forth contest, Kaiba proves once and for all that he is indeed the better rich man. For his final play, Kaiba brings out his Luster Dragon number two, his Chaos Emperor Dragon, and all three of his Blue Eyes White Dragons, which gives Siegfried's Valkyrie Brunhilde a whopping 3,300 attack points. 
Kaiba decides to be a honey badger and attacks with his luster dragon number two, and it ends up being destroyed no matter. Brunhilde is now 300 points weaker because her special effect is that she gains 300 attack points for every dragon on the field. So Kaiba attacks with his Chaos Emperor dragon, but that monster is destroyed in their attack, while Brunhilde survives because of her special ability, where when she is attacked, she can stick around on the field by dropping her defense points from 2,000 to 1,000, and this attack then brings her attack points from 3,300 to just 3,000 to now 2,700. Kaiba attacks with one of his Blue Eyes White Dragons, but Brunhilde attacks the attack thanks again to her special ability. And now we get to the point where Siegfried realizes he has a bit of a problem. Brunhilde has no defense points left to take the hit for her. She'll end up going bye-bye when Blue Eyes number two comes at her. And when she goes bye-bye, Kaiba has one more Blue Eyes White Dragon left to destroy Siegfried with. And that's exactly what happens. So, as I say in Deutschland, Spiel ist aus. And so, the finale to this tournament is Yugi versus Leon. Except, Leon seems a bit off. While during his duel with Rebecca, he seemed pretty carefree and fun-loving, here he's very intense and very aggressive. And before the first episode of this duel ends, we find out why he's in such a bad mood. He's not dueling for fun anymore. He's dueling to honor his family, specifically his big brother, Siegfried von Schroeder, because Leon Wilson is not Leon Wilson. His name is Leon von Schroeder. Everyone around Leon can tell that Siegfried is manipulating his little brother, and his manipulations are made apparent when Leon plays a card Siegfried gave him. That is illegal. A card known as the Golden Castle of Stromberg, a card that also contains a very deadly virus. Not the kind of the virus that destroys someone's most powerful monsters, the kind of virus that destroys a computer network. Siegfried tricked Leon into playing a card that would destroy Hypercorp network. However, with the power of this being a filler arc, Yugi rises above hate and never gives up and ultimately beats the ridiculously overpowered card on a technicality. <laughs> This illegal card requires the opponent to deposit half of their deck into the graveyard as a way for the summoner to keep it on the field. But the problem comes when you realize he only has one card left in his deck. So the Golden Castle waves bye bye to the field and Yugi wins the game. <sighs> I miss the big five. There were so many strange characters in this arc and literally only two were given anything to do. The duels were pretty fun with some pretty creative decks, but... <sighs> God, this was pretty forgettable. This was... Oof, not gonna lie, I, I didn't like this one as much. 6 out of 10. Okay, this is gonna be a weird one. The final episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters aired in the United States on June 10th, 2006. This specific arc aired from September 9th to November 25th, 2006. Capsule Monsters was a series of 12 episodes commissioned by four kids. These episodes have no Japanese counterpart. They were only made on behalf of the American studio or the American audience. If you don't remember anything about it, it's probably because as I've already pointed out, it aired three months after the show actually ended. Its episodes are meant to take place between the Grand Championship arc and the proper final arc of the series. So I will cover it, but it has a much stranger premise than the rest of the show. For starters, it isn't actually focused on card games. What it is focused on is a board game called Capsule Monsters, which works by... I actually don't know how it works and it's not really specified. So, um, what's the story? Well, Joey wins the gang four tickets to India, but their plane crashes in the middle of some strange jungle where they run into an archaeological colleague of Yugi's grandpa who takes them to the ruins where Solomon disappeared. The gang then realize there seems to be a mystical portal between the real world and the realm of capsule monsters. Yugi, believing this is where Solomon went, 
jumps on in the hopes that he can save his grandpa from mortal danger. And when they do find Yugi's grandpa and do manage to return to the real world, they are confronted by Alex, Mr. Moto's archaeological colleague, who is currently being possessed by the sinister half of... Fucking... Alexander the Great? What? 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 Initially, the gang all have to face Alexander in a battle to see who will take control of the power to rule the entire world. Which, in typical Yu-Gi-Oh fashion, is a battle that is won by the Pharaoh. Once reunited with his good half, Alexander confides in Yami that when he ruled Egypt, he was actually inspired in large part by what it was that Yami did as the ruler of Egypt. And he really hopes that the Pharaoh will be able to remember who he was soon. Aww. You know what I'm thinking of right now? In a more mature series, Yami would probably be a little angry talking to the guy that conquered his kingdom. Anyway, I don't know what inspired this actual story for an extra 12 episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh! Because the thing that made Yu-Gi-Oh! interesting was the interpersonal conflicts between characters and the actual strategy and quick thinking that went into all of these duels. With capsule monsters, well, these connections are so long established and don't really break any new ground. And the actual dueling aspect is long gone because it's just summoning monsters and throwing against other monsters. whoop de frickin do in fact, with the method used to gather these monsters, that being just binding the capsules in random locations and touching them in order to make them yours, this arc makes me think of Pokemon than it does Yu-Gi-Oh! On the brighter side, I do think that the Alexander the Great character was pretty cool, especially once you realize the Alexander we've been following is stuck in the capsule world, but his evil side is currently possessing Mr. Alex. That was actually a pretty neat development, but it's not enough to save this particular section of Season 5 assuming you even want to call it season 5 because it was commissioned and then aired after season 5 had already been completed. If you're binging this season on Hulu, here's my advice. Finish episode 14 of the season, then skip straight to episode 27 and completely skip over episodes 15 through 26. You will be so much happier for it because this arc genuinely almost bored me to tears. 5.5 5 out of 10. We now return to the real season 5. Thank God. This story doesn't do any waiting. We close up the passenger side door and Takahashi hits the gas on this fresh off the lot Lamborghini with zero hesitation. This show might be a copy of a copy, but, but you can still feel those old mystical horror elements. And you see Bakura running for his life while being stalked by the spirit of the Millennium Ring, as the spirit talks down to him like Bakura is his ex-girlfriend, who doesn't seem to understand that they belong to him. We then follow up with Weeble and Rex, who, who clearly haven't learned anything about tampering with forces beyond their understanding since Season 4, seeing as how they intentionally stole the Egyptian God cards while also accidentally stealing the Millennium Ring rod and necklace. This is an act that Yami Bakura does not take kindly to, so he retakes possession of his ring and banishes these two morons to the Shadow Realm. Having run after the creeps, but not caring for the ring's methods, the Pharaoh confronts Yami Bakura, but they have a counter for every bit of the Spirit of the Puzzle's condemnations. Yami Bakura offers the Pharaoh an invitation to a shadow game they'll be having in the future, before moving along to give their rivals some attention. A power outage here, a threat to Mokoba's life there, and Yami Bakura has booked himself a one-on-one -on -one matchup with the one and only Seto Kaiba. A matchup he sadly has to leave early, but offers Kaiba a parting gift for all of his time and effort, the Millennium Eye. We then move back to Yugi and the Pharaoh as they head out to the tombs of Egypt, along with their friends, plus Merrick, Ashizu, and Odeon. And so just like last season, Yami points Slaper, Obelisk, and Ra at the carving, and unlike last season, Spirit is pulled from Yugi and the puzzle and is brought into a dimension built from his lost memories of the past. There are two problems with this though. Yami is now ostensibly an amnesiac in ancient Egypt and the portion of the Yami Bakura spirit that was left in the puzzle was brought in too along with the main portion in the ring. So now Yami has to deal with this psycho alone and try to find his memories at the same time. You gotta be fucked! 
fucking kidding me? On the flip side, though, we see Yugi and Prinz be visited by a man named Shadi, a recurring character from the first three seasons. I had mentioned him before now, but he's a guardian of the Millennium Items, who himself is the holder of the Millennium Key and Scales. Shadi explains the situation with Bakura, and after Yugi demands that he be able to go in and help the Pharaoh, Shadi opens access to the inner workings of the puzzle so that Yugi and the gang can eventually find a back door into the world of the Pharaoh's memory. It's during this journey that we finally, after so many years, realize what the backstory of who the evil Bakoro really is. He was a peasant boy in a village called Kelelna, and his people were slaughtered at the command of Yami's uncle, High Priest Akhenaten. This slaughter was done to create the Millennium Items so that Yami's father and his court could defend Egypt from invasion. Their mission was a success, but in doing so, they created a far greater evil in the form of the evil Bakura's true self, a being from the Shadow Realm named Zork. Naturally, Bakura's goal is to usher in the return of this creature, creating a world of internal darkness. Unfortunately for him, while in the memory world, Yugi, the Pharaoh, and their friends realize the only way to stop this creature is to speak the Pharaoh's Name. Realizing this, Bakura steps back once Zork is brought back to stop Yugi by doing what people do best in this series, play a card game. Bakura tries to beat Yugi by forcing him to deck out, but Yugi pulls out a Hail Mary combo. He summons his Gandora, the Dragon of Destruction, which destroys every monster currently in play, then attacks Bakura directly with his Silent Swordsman giving Yugi the win. With Bakura out of his way, Yugi and the gang find the Pharaoh's name and run out to tell him before it's too late. And while the gang do reach the Pharaoh in time, there's one small problem. No one who saw the name knows how to speak it, because no one in this cast knows how to speak ancient Egyptian. But through the power of friendship, they managed to inscribe the symbols from the stone into the pendant Taya had gifted the pharaoh earlier in the York. And so, the pharaoh can at last speak his name, and you should all remember it, I said it at the start, the pharaoh's name is... Atem. And with this knowledge, the pharaoh calls out the Egyptian god monsters, and he uses his new power to merge them into one even greater power creator of light. One blast from her, and it's game over for the Lord of Darkness. Following this, the creator tells Atem that his journey is nearly complete. He has but one final task left to complete, then he can enter the next life. This task is then revealed in the next episode, but until then, Atem offers his Millennium Puzzle and his title as Pharaoh to his cousin, High Priest Seto. He then returns to the present with Yugi and his friends. The memory world arc is an incredibly interesting thing with, with so many intriguing details. There's so many things I glossed over just to focus on the basic skeleton of the story. And all of it is good, apart from one detail. I get the feeling this is something they only did in the four kids version of the show. But you see, whenever a Tim asks about what happened in Kel Lelna, someone will say, Oh, it was a terrible thing, but... Don't feel too bad about it, everyone in that village was evil. When Akhenaten said it at first, I thought it was the, the ancient Egyptian equivalent to when people dr try to justify police shootings by saying that people killed were criminals. But when another character said the same thing, I realized, oh, that's not the ancient Egyptian equivalent to saying that, that's uh, the kid's television fantasy writer equivalent. That wasn't inadvertent commentary, that was a lazy way to say the good guys are still good guys, which does bring this arc down a peg. If these writers could have stuck the landing on that plot point, this arc would have been an 8 out of 10, but they didn't, so as it stands, I'm going to have to bump this down to a 7 out of 10. Following the Pharaoh and the gang's return to the present, they're all met once again by Merrick, Ishizu, and Odeon, who inform everyone what Atem's final task is. In order to pass into the next life, the Pharaoh must face a worthy opponent in a battle and then lose. Joey and Kaiba both volunteer to face Atem, but in the end, Yugi makes the decision that he and he alone will duel the Pharaoh. Logically, this proves to be a rather tricky matchup for the two men, because while the magic does physically separate the two of them from one another, they still know each other's strategies inside and out. For every move Yugi makes, Atem has the perfect counter, and vice versa. But the duel finally ends when the effect of Yugi's gold sarcophagus magic card comes to play. The effect being that Yugi will place another card inside the sarcophagus, and if Atem plays the same card, its effect is negated. The card Yugi predicted Atem would play? Monster Reborn. So, when Atem attempts 
to bring back Slifer the Sky Dragon, he is negated, and all 200 of his life points are left wide open for a direct attack from Yugi's Silent Magician. And in a moment reminiscent of Nick Jackson nodding at Adam Page before the Hangman delivered a second Buckshot Larry to Kenny Omega at Bull Gear 2021, or of Shawn Michaels saying the words, I'm sorry, I love you, for knocking Ric Flair's lights out with Sweet Chin Music at WrestleMania 24, Yugi directs one final attack at Tem, and the Pharaoh is free to join the other side. Yugi, Taya, Joey, and Tristan all tearfully bid farewell to their old friend, and Tem bids them his own goodbye and salutes them all with a thumbs up before entering his afterlife with all his friends and family from Egypt. The series then ends with Yugi reassuring his friends that sometimes the end of one journey is just the beginning of another. The final duel is a genuinely terrific batch of episodes. I'm generally not the kind of person who cries at my entertainment, but seeing Yugi beat the Pharaoh and attempt complimenting him for being such a great duelist really did make me misty-eyed. Yes, you heard me right. I cried over fucking Yu-Gi-Oh. Judge me if you feel so inclined for it. I feel incredibly cringe for it, but damn it, man. I had a rough week when I was rating this. I needed it. I really needed some comfort media. And in addition to being such a great duel in general, it's also just so touching to see everyone's reactions to the duel. It's not just the usual speech from Taya where she's screaming, Doctor, you have to save him! Quick, inject him with 40 cc's of friendship! She's actually very conflicted. She wants what's best for a Tim, but she's not ready to say goodbye. Kaiba's reactions are also very intriguing. At first, he's dismissing that Yugi has any chance and just assumes that a Tim was the true king of games all along, but changes his tune as soon as Yugi manages to take down a Tim's Egyptian god cards and even verbally declares out loud that Yugi really is the king of games. Joey also has some particularly good insights into the duel going on. When the now good Bakora suggests that Yugi wants to lose after all, when they all witness Atem's obelisk destroy one of Yugi's most powerful monsters, but Yugi just smiles through it all, Joey dismisses that thought. In his observation, Yugi is smiling because he's having fun for years when Ever there were serious stakes at him. Atem was dueling, and Yugi just took a back seat. But now, Yugi is up close and personal with an Egyptian god, and it's all so exciting. And the ultimate icing on this cake is Atem gently telling a crying Yugi that a champion doesn't belong on his knee, followed by a truly beautiful speech from Joey. True friends may be hard to leave, but they're impossible to forget. And even though his stay wasn't as long as we would have liked, we're lucky we knew him at all. And for as much as it's been joked about and memed to death, even in the series by Taya herself at one point, the driving force of Yu-Gi-Oh! is friendship. Joey's English and Japanese names were deliberately chosen because when the syllable Joe is combined with the symbol Yu from Yugi, you get the Japanese word Yujo, meaning friendship. And this last arc encapsulates the bitterest pill there is with any friendship. Saying goodbye. And this is probably the best way for both the Tem and this series to have said goodbye. 9 out of 10, absolutely wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. I really love Yu-Gi-Oh! As a 10-year-old kid, this was one of my favorite shows. Watching it either on Saturday mornings or late at night on Fridays was always such a treat. And watching it again as a 28-year-old adult, yeah, it's still pretty great. Is it corny? My friends, when I was 11, I went on a trip out west with my family for one of our stops with South Dakota. We went and saw Mount Rushmore and it was amazing. But while we were there, we also visited a venue called the Corn Palace, a building covered head to toe in beautiful and creative murals made from actual kernels of corn. That building has less corn in it than Yu-Gi-Oh. Obviously this show is corny and it can get a bit grating at times, but it's also terrific either regardless of its cornball nature or often because of it. The duels are consistently exciting, the villains are consistently great, and the actual story of Yugi and Atem is also really, really great. It's just really good. I'm gonna give the full Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monster series an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review, and if you did, stay tuned for 
my future triple review of all three Yu-Gi-Oh! movies. That's The Pyramid of Light, Bonds Beyond Time, and Dark Side of Dimensions. Now, that's going to be exciting. I also have plans to be discussing the uh, Jeanette McCurdy memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, so stay tuned for that. Please subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll see when I post those videos. And be sure to stick around later in the year for my top 10 movies of 2022. Coming in December, or possibly January, who knows? And while I still have your attention, please be sure to like this video and comment down below with your thoughts and share this video with your friends. Have a great day, everyone. Woodstock, out.